Hello, everybody, and welcome to MTS's Recovery Road webinar series. This is the last webinar in our Recovery Road series, and today we are sitting down with tour operators. So for those of you who are new to MTS's webinars, my name is Kat Shaw, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. I'm the Director of Marketing and Content for Mountain Travel Symposium. Before we begin, I just want to go over some housekeeping and talk a little bit about, a little bit about how the webinar is going to flow and some of the features that we have. So we will be doing a one-on-one -on -one conversation with four leaders that are uh, tour operators from around the globe. And once we have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, then we'll move to a Q&A. So please use the Q&A box to submit questions for our panelists, and we will get to as many of those as we can. There's also a chat box. Feel free to use the chat box to uh, send any sort of comments through, but if you have specific questions, send those through the Q&A. And then we will also be conducting a survey at the end of the webinar for your feedback on how educational the content was, and we'd love to also get your feedback on future webinar topics. So that survey will open up at the end of the webinar. So please make sure you submit your feedback and your comments there. It's incredibly helpful and valuable to us. So with that, I'd like to introduce everyone to our panelists today. We have Karen Nesmith, the president of Ski Can, Gordon Ritter, the purchasing director of Ski, Lakes, and Mountains for TUI Group, Eric Reistet, Mountain Travel Specialist for Alpine Adventures, and Dan Sherman, the CMO of Ski.com. So now I'd like to begin and welcome Dan on stage. And I think everyone will be a little shocked. He looks a little different <laughs> than his headshot on that last slide. So the COVID look. <laughs> Welcome, Dan. It is you under there. Um, it is. You're, it's, you're the first people I've seen. So, um, yeah, I, I told Dan he did not have to uh, get a haircut or shave to be a part of the webinar. So we're we're really glad that he's here. And uh, so so let's just jump right in. Um, I'd love to know, and, and we had spoke a couple of weeks back preparing for the webinar, and since then, we've had a lot of mountain resorts make announcements about um, their opening and their schedules and kind of their processes and stuff. And so what have, have you been seeing at ski.com since those announcements have been made? And, um, you know, what are the, the booking trends looking like? Yeah, so when we, I guess when we spoke a few weeks ago, I was saying that the, the one, the biggest thing that needs to happen for, for us to see a spike in leads and reservations is that a, a resorts need to start making announcements uh, about policies and procedures. So since then, Bell Resorts made their big announcement, I guess, uh, about a week and a half ago. And I think it's great. Um, I think that it's, it's really interesting. I think it's setting, um, setting the stage for other resorts to follow suit in their own way. And, you know, I think that the um, skiers' perception is mixed, but I think a lot of people just don't understand it. And I think that that also creates a really great opportunity for ski.com and tour operators in general to help um, kind of break it down and explain what the policies are, how to navigate the waters, and, and, and what the ski season is going to look like. So, uh, yes, we have seen an increase in, in, in call volume and in lead generation. Um, and, and generally this summer we've seen our, our leads are obviously down, uh, no surprise there, but our closing rates are, are high and people are, people are eager to go skiing. So you said you, your call volume is up. What types of conversations are you having? Are those different conversations than you would typically have prior to, to, to customers booking? Right, when I say my, the, the call volume is up, I mean, since the announcements, I don't necessarily mean year over year. But yeah, I, I think that again, people are, there's a mixture of people. Uh, they're, they're kicking the tires, they're, they're trying to figure out what's what. They're also looking for refundable ski vacations or refundable packages, which we have a campaign that's focusing on that. Uh, and then also, I think obviously people are really shopping for Epic Passes, um, just focusing on Villa Resorts because 
as part of the announcement, they're giving um, priority to, to pass holders. So, and then the the price increase is, is next week. So there's a, there's a lot of decisions to be made between now and then if people are going to, to purchase their pass at the lowest price or the lowest price now. Uh, so there's just a lot of people looking at, at options. And, and again, the airlines also making announcements of being more flexible. So there's right. just, there's a lot of moving parts going on out there. And again, it's a great opportunity for us to help people uh, understand what's going on and help direct traffic and, and direct them to the resorts that make sense for them based on location, based on policies, based on everything. Uh, so you mentioned a campaign that you've got going on now about um, uh, having the ability to, you know, change or reschedule and re refunds. What does that campaign look like and, and what does that encompass? Yeah, so we were back in the early summer, we were um, trying to create some marketing that earlier than we normally do, but just focused around flexibility. And when we were putting the creative together, um, you know, kind of a typical button on a display ad is, is book now or just book. And to me, that seemed a little bit too firm. So I was thinking like R RSVP, that seems a little bit less intimidating. And then we came up, came up with an acronym RSVP standing for refundable ski vacation packages. Oh, so, okay. so we went out with a, um, a campaign, I guess in June, pushing that and uh, the landing page on our website is, is by far our number one traffic page with um, actually significant time on site. And it's not, uh, um, it's not a flat uh, policy. We're, we're working with our partners and their policies, but again, we're just trying to help direct traffic for the consumer to, to find a policy that works for them. No deposit, a small deposit, um, uh, you know, 25 day, 30 day, 40 day policy, whatever that may be, whatever makes them comfortable. So you said you're working really closely with your partners. Has your relationship with your partners changed? Has the lines of communication been more open throughout this whole uh, pandemic? What's that been like? Well, it varies. You know, we, we work with a lot of people all over the world and, and we're still being in touch with our, our international partners as well, even though we don't expect to see a lot of travelers going international in general this year. But it depends. Our, our conversations vary. Our relationships vary. There are some uh, hotel or lodging suppliers that are working very closely with us, um, modifying their policies based on what we're explaining to them as the demand. Um, there are others that I, I think there are some uh, property management companies or, or lodging suppliers who are maybe expecting fewer people this year and therefore want to maximize as much revenue as they can. And that affects our relationship too. So it goes both ways. And again, I think that we're in a really good position this year where we have a lot of people calling us trying to say, we, don't, we just want to go skiing. We don't know what to do. So we really are directing traffic to our partners that are working with us um, in all the right ways, I guess. So are you seeing a lot of new customers or, you know, people who maybe wouldn't have considered a ski vacation or a mountain destination before, but they've got open spaces or it's within their own state or something. What is, what does the customer look like? And is it different than usual? Well, I think a lot, I would say that so far it's probably not a lot different, a lot different. We have a huge amount of repeat business um, and those people are booking. But I think that we will see a lot of new customers. I think especially from the travel um, advisor perspective, travel advisors are used to selling Europe. They're used to selling cruise. They're not going to be doing that as much this year, if at all. So I think that we're seeing a lot of um, travel advisors turning to us, asking us to help them present ski to their clients. So I think that we're going to see a lot of new business, both on the retail side and on the travel uh, agency side. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the successes that you've been seeing so far? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be huge, but, um, you know, where are you seeing some positive things? Well, I think my kind of five point success story includes the, the resorts making announcements, which they're starting to COVID or sorry, before that, the schools, um, mm -hmm people having some sense of normalcy of what's happening in their local school districts, which 
would then dictate how they vacation. So are people going to, to be um, following the typical school schedule? Then COVID, is it spreading? Is it, are we getting under control? Just what's the general state of things in the resort and outside? The election, um, where we see different things, different booking patterns every elect, election year. This one will be a lot different based on COVID and less on financials, I think. And then snow. I think uh, people will be booking later than usual. And I think that, you know, we, we don't think really snow comes into play as much because they're destination skiers and they're booking so far in advance that they just hope and expect great snow. But I think that we are going to be seeing a lot more last minute reservations. I think that snow is going to affect that. And the positive is that we're doing okay. Uh, we are down year over year, but things are looking up. Things are, are um, we have a lot of quotes going out. We have a lot of reservations coming in. And based on this last minute trend, I think we're going to have a great season. May not be the best season we've ever had, but I think that we'll be okay. Got a, some positive vibes you're putting out there. Uh, and so I've got time for one more question. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, the booking windows are shorter. How are you managing that? Is that more difficult for your teams and for your partners to, to handle not having as much advance notice or, um, do you know, do you have to be more flexible? What, what does that entail for, for your ski.com? Well, it shouldn't, I mean, it's too early to tell because when I say last, you know, shorter window, I think that it's going to be significantly shorter. So it's too early to tell, but that's no problem for us. We have the systems in place. We have the staff in place. Uh, we have about 68 um, mountain travel experts or salespeople, and they're supported by an operations staff, an air desk, a customer service. So if we do get these last minute reservations, we're equipped to handle them. And, you know, I, and when I say last minute, we can't do you know, if we have day before, it becomes problematic for several, re several reasons. But if we have a week, two weeks, a month, for us, that's, you know, that's a shorter window. Normally, it's about 80 days. So if we have a couple weeks, that's, that's plenty of time for us. Good. Great. All right. Well, that wraps it up for our one-on-one -on -one conversation. But we will see you back uh, when we are ready for Q&A. So thanks Sounds so much, John. And uh, now I'd like to have Karen with Ski Can join me. Hi, Kat. Hi, welcome. So uh, thank you. for everyone in our audience, Karen is coming to us from just outside of Toronto. So Karen, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing uh, in the Canadian market with booking trends and uh, consumer interest. Sure, Kat. I thought I would start with a little bit of an introduction on SkiCan uh, because I'm assuming SkiCan is probably not quite as well known as Ski.com. Um, we, so we're a Canadian tour operator based in Guelph, Ontario. So Guelph is a city that's just west of Toronto. And our team is located virtually right across the country uh, in Vermeer, Revelstoke, Montreal, Toronto, and Guelph. And our clients are predominantly located in Quebec and Ontario, the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. It's important to note this because in Canada, 80% of COVID cases and 94% of deaths related to COVID have taken place in Quebec and Ontario. So this is undoubtedly part of the decision-making landscape right now when people are thinking about travel for next year. In terms of bookings, uh, in the last five years, we've seen quite a growth in interest in international ski travel. That has pretty much gone dormant this year. We are getting almost no inquiries for international travel. It's uh, almost entirely Western Canada. Um, and we're also seeing bit of an increase in interest in dry vacations, so that's predominantly Quebec, uh, but they're mostly um, seven-day vacations, air included, so that really hasn't changed for us. Uh, mostly Eastern skiers going to the West. And are you having lots of communications and lots of inquiries and questions with your customers, like Dan said, he was just kind of fielding lots of uncertainty and questions. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, I would say almost everyone that's approaching us that's interested in booking a trip falls into two categories. Um, and so the first category is the let's do this group. The second is the what if client. And so the first category, I would say that these are, are people that have traveled with us quite a bit. So uh, at least once a year, if not multiple times a year, we often know them from ski shows or they have, uh, a lot of these folks have been on hosted ski trips that we, that we sell called ski escapes. And so we tend to know them more. We have more of an established relationship with them. And they, a lot of these individuals uh, are sending us an email or it's a quick phone call or even a text message where they're saying, here's what I think, what do you think? We'll send them a few ideas and then they respond with a book me in to whatever it is. So the decision-making process, the whole transaction is easy and it's fast. And uh, so that group is not as big as the second group. We want to really move people into this, the first group for sure. So the second group is the, the, what, if, uh, the what if client. And so I, I should say also, uh, Kat, that every, really everyone that's approaching us, it's, they're not fence sitters. They're, they're keen to book. Once they've actually contacted us, they want it to happen. They want to go on a ski trip. Um, so the determination is there. But the second group of um, clients needs a lot more information. They uh, don't quite have the confidence to commit, certainly not as quickly. And so they'll ask us, well, what, if, what happens if I get to the airport and I'm turned away because I have a high temperature, I can't board the plane? And uh, what if this happens, or, or am I covered by insurance? And they'll kind of go, go into all kinds of different scenarios on insurance. And then they want to know about the different transfer protocols or the lift lineups and, and social distancing, and it goes on and on and on. And those clients have forced us to really know our game this year. And so um, that it's been a very interesting process. A lot of work is, is involved with that particular group of clients. Um, aside from that, I'd say that we, that group is, is really just, it, they take a longer time and they're, they're still probably coming back to us and saying, I need more time. I want to see what happens in terms of whether or not a vaccine will come out. So they're waiting. So what are you telling those clients who are asking about what if this and what if that, and where does your responsibility lie when, you know, something happens with, as the tour operator, when something happens with their um, trip that is, quite frankly, out of your control? That's a, a great question. I would say that this is, um, this has required, so usually we, in the past, we've had one hour team meetings once a week. We, that has moved to being two to three hours a week. And it's all about sharing information on the newest, um, the newest information that we've received from our, from our partners in resorts and how we can talk to clients. It's a very careful balance of ensuring that our clients understand that travel will not be the same this year and they need to have, they need to adjust their expectations appropriately. At the same time, we're trying to also build confidence. So we're not trying to scare anyone away. So it's a, it's a really careful balance that we need to hit. And um, so, you know, you had mentioned when, when we were talking uh, prior to this webinar that, you know, there are risks, inherent risks with any type of travel in any sort of situation. So have you, uh, aware things can get canceled or, you know, people can, can not be able to attend a trip. Have you changed your policies to be more flexible? Um, like Dan was mentioning, you know, the, the, um, RSVP, RSVP. booking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what have you done there to kind of ease the, the traveler's mind? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, actually back in May, we sent out a poll to our clients. It's not something that we do that often, but we wanted to understand where they were at. And we learned two essential things from that poll. Uh, the first was that 
we asked what were the key considerations for our clients in terms of looking at skiing and booking ski trips for next year. Interestingly, a vaccine was not the number one consideration. A flexible booking policy was the number one consideration. And the next thing that we learned in this poll was that everyone clearly told us that they did not want to think about booking for quite a while, that they were not ready. So we really took that information and, and uh, we decided that we were going to hold off on any communications, any marketing initiatives until we felt that people were ready. And then we took that time and we went to all of our resort partners and talked to them, invited them to collaborate with us on figuring out a flexible uh, booking policy. And so similar to what Dan has done, we figured out where we can offer the most flexible terms. And so we're basically um, allowing people to hold a spot right now. It's a worry-free booking policy and they don't actually pay for their trip until 40 days prior to departure. There's a lot of uh, reasons that we've pursued this too. So there's a lot that we're, you know, we're really trying to minimize the work that we have to do as well. So that, and when I say minimize, um, ensure that we're not doing too much work now in the event that, the, that we face a whole bunch of cancellations. Right, right. Not too far down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that, that's, I'm sure, a huge time suck for your team to book things and reschedule and recancel versus just booking them once a little bit closer, closer to. So, um, well, so it sounds like your, your lines of communication have been incredibly open with your, your customers. And, and do you think that the, your relationship in the relationship between the tour operator and the customer has changed and will, you know, be more open? In the future? It's definitely changed. There's no doubt about it. We didn't used to go into detail about the booking and payment cancellation policy. That was something that we actually just left that to our clients to do their own, to, to read our policies and to ask us about that. We did not highlight that right away. Whereas now we are identifying any time that a payment is due immediately or any time that a refund would, will not be available in the event of a cancellation, so a credit would be available. We're identifying that right uh, at the get-go. So things have changed, definitely. Yeah. And well, I think, it, I, I guess I'll just say, Kat, sorry, I, I think it would be wrong for us to pretend things haven't changed. I think that would be, you know, something in travel that we don't want to do. Um, there's a lot that I think individuals are, are that they have on their mind. And um, I think we need to be sensitive to that. Yep, I, I, I think you're right on point there. And everyone recognizes that things have changed. And this is, you know, the new way of, of doing things. So great. Well, you've really provided a lot of insights for our audience. And um, we will see you uh, back for our Q&A. So thank you so much, Karen. Thanks. And next, I'd like to bring Eric Reistet from Alpine Adventures up to have a conversation. Hi, Eric. How are you today? Okay. Hello, everybody. Good. Uh, so, so why don't you start off by telling us what you're seeing at Alpine Adventures as far as booking and booking trends and if it is similar or different from what Dan and uh, Karen have mentioned already. You know, we've, we've been seeing pretty much the same. Um, year over year clients are still calling. They're still trying to figure things out. Um, Europe, some of our Europe travelers are looking at domestic trips for this year instead of um, going overseas, just with everything being closed over there by the governments yet. Um, other than that, um, people are, you know, rebooking um, from years past. Um, the, you know, the similar trends is what everybody else was saying. It's um, the big thing is is the flexibility that we're seeing from our our partners and being able to not have to hold somebody to it right away. When you hold people's feet to the fire, it scares them right away. 
Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so how have things changed with your partners that you're working with on the flexibility and how have you navigated those conversations and um, relationships with your partners? Is everyone on the same page about the flexible policies? Um, it varies by supplier, uh, lodging in general. Um, the, the ski areas and the rental companies and things like that have always been very flexible with, um, you know, canceling, changing, things like that. But the lodging um, obviously is, has made changes on later deposits. Um, you know, when you, the closer in um, used to be 60 days, now you're seeing 30 days things like that. The other, uh, the other pieces, the airlines came out last week with a big change. And that is a, I think that's going to drive some people back into the air and get them moving again. Right. Yeah. With all of those flexible, uh, cancellation or, you know, no, ch no change fees, um, that, that really gives the consumer a lot of comfort that they have have the ability to, to make a change uh, without being penalized. So, so what types of conversations are you having at Alpine Adventures with, um, with your clients? Have, have, has, have the consultations increased similar to what you know, Dan and Karen were saying, or um, is, is that about steady from, from past years? I would say it's definitely up, just because the policies have changed so much. Um, from last year to this year, um, it's a big change and uh, people don't understand it. So to educate is the big thing. Get people so they know how the Epic Pass is going to work, how the Icon Pass is going to work. Um, there may, you know, in the United States, there's going to be limits on the amount of people that are on the mountain this year. Um, similar to what Deer Valley did does, we're going to see it on most North American resorts this year. Um, Europe, on the other hand, is not. Um, so if we can get there, you can guarantee a skiing. Um, but that's a little different, too, because people aren't quite ready to pull the trigger on a Europe trip since everything is still closed. Right, right. And so are you seeing a lot of interest in the season passes as well, like Dan was saying, for that, you know, priority with the Epic Pass and, and Vail? It's definitely up. And last year, the Epic Pass changed and they offered single day Epic Passes. You know, you could get a one, two, three, four, five day Epic Pass. And with the announcement last week that you get up to seven preferred days that is pushing people earlier. The prices are better on it, um, and it's it's working to people's advantage if they're book, if they're willing to book early. You have to be knowing that you're going to go skiing this year, right? And so, how have your marketing messages changed throughout the pandemic? Um, and and what you know, what were some of your earlier marketing messages versus what you're currently pushing out to the market now that um, you know, airlines have made announcements and, and mountain resorts have made announcements. You know, we've been pushing out to the social um, media sites, um, showing, you know, specials that are out there, showing people that, you know, there's still places that are really good deals right now. Um, book early. Um, we're here. You know, we're ready for you when you're ready to make the decision. That's that's pretty much the big one is that, you know, we're here and we're, we're waiting for you. We're ready. Right. So not super aggressive, but just kind of being their, their companion in, in travel and their resource in travel. Correct. Right. Great. And so what are some bright spots that you've seen uh, throughout this, this whole period? In, you know, now the kids are back in school, um, kind of going off of what Dan said, it did spark a little interest. Um, you can always use more. The, uh, but people are starting to look at the holidays now. Labor Day's over. They don't 
the next trip would be Labor Day week or would be the holidays. And people are starting to call and look at those dates and, you know, school calendars drive our business in a lot of ways. And a lot of schools didn't have that until very recently. So with those numbers out and dates out, it pushes people to what they can do. Are you seeing any sort of increase in interest in weekdays because people perhaps um, and, and this I would think would be those without children, but have the flexibility to, you know, work from a mountain destination during the week and, and ski for a half day or whatnot with everyone, you know, working from home. Not as of yet, but as the education of how the passes and lift tickets are going to work, I think we are going to get pushed in that direction some that if you book late, you may not be able to ski that Saturday and Sunday. You're going to have to get pushed over to some weekdays. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say is your biggest takeaway from, um, from the entire ex experience in, in uh, the past few months? Well, it's like nothing anybody's ever seen. Um, you know, in Florida, we had you know, I, I'm down here right in the midst of some of the worst that we saw for numbers. And, uh, you know, now that everything's coming down, phones are starting to ring again. But when the numbers start spiking, the phones are inversely proportional. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yep. There's, there's, there's a huge, huge piece of the puzzle here. So... All right, Eric. Well, that wraps up our time with you, and we will see you in uh, a few minutes for uh, Q and A. So, thank you so much. And now, I'd like to uh, welcome Gordon Ritter with Tui to join us. And Gordon is uh, coming all the way from London, so he's it's his evening. So, thank you for spending your evening with us and the MTS uh, audience, Gordon. No problem. So um, why don't you give a little bit of an overview for our audience uh, on, on TUI, uh, just, just because we've, we've got a primarily North American audience, so there may be not as many familiar. No, so I, I work for the um, one part of the business that um, uh, includes the uh, ski business, which to many people uh, would just be known as Crystal. Um, it's the UK's and Ireland's largest um, ski tour operator. Um, it's dominated by package um, holidays, meaning long stay. Uh, ski holidays normally sold on um, a seven night basis. Um, and like I say, they're packaged. So uh, the core elements are included in the, in the, um, in the holiday uh, arrangement. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a unique business in some ways, although, or, although all commonplace, I guess, across most of Europe in that the bulk of our passengers travel on our own charter um, aircraft. Um, so it's it's uh, it's you know it's what we would call you know a package arrangement and um, just a small proportion of our business is what we would call short break and uh, North America for us is slightly different in that it is more tailor made it is it's still long stay but it's more tailor made meaning we use uh, third party carriers and the such like. And so what are you seeing over in the UK as far as booking trends go uh, and is it different than what we've been seeing here in the US and Canada. I was listening to um, <laughs> all three, actually Eric, Karen, they all said the same thing. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing about this um, window or booking cycle for winter 2021 that resembles anything we've seen before. Um, no sooner were we repatriating customers, we were, well, it, come go back to March, we were repatriating tens of thousands of our customers out of the European Alps and North America back to the UK as borders slammed shut. And then really in April and, and May, um, when we would expect, you know, under normal conditions, we'd know ex exactly what to expect in terms of booking intake. We were effectively in hibernation. Um, no other word for it, really. Um, and uh, June, we saw uh, some form of recovery. In other words, we saw booking numbers increase. 
and uh, in July um, it improved further. Um, but then during August it's gone a little quiet again. Um, and again, trying to trying to uh, match these booking patterns up against prior years, you, you just tear your hair out. You, you won't find any anything. Uh, any kind of semblance of normality um, in the booking trends or the stats. But, you know, one thing I will say is people are booking ski holidays. Yes, there's a question mark over in what volume are they booking, but they are booking. Well, that's certainly good to good to hear. So how how have you been communicating with the market and, um, you know, what sort of messaging have you been putting out there? <sighs> From a, from a crystal perspective, um, we spent the early part of the lockdown, you might say, like a lot of our um, colleagues and other businesses in the UK and Ireland, we were, we were talking to our customers, but we weren't actively marketing to them. There really wasn't much point at that, at that point in time. Um, and since then, as we've kind of moved into July and August, uh, the big thing for us has been, you know, um, inspiring our customers again reminding them of, of the the need to go to the mountains during the winter and at the same time a big part of our marketing has been around reassurance we need customers to know that you know under what whatever the circumstances are at the time they travel that they will be looked after and it's i guess to a degree when you work on the uk and irish market you there are some obligations there anyway in terms of protecting the customer uh but as an operator, you need to take responsibility and, and make sure that, as has been, been mentioned by some of the other panelists, you know, it's about maybe having, you know, low deposit arrangements for your holidays. It's about reminding them about the financial protection that exists um, in the marketplace and perhaps within the tour operators. It's in, um, letting them know that and putting in place flexibility for them. So under normal conditions, you maybe wouldn't have quite the same level of flexibility in terms of amending your booking or changing your booking. And, and also um, what's becoming more relevant now is, as we head towards what would normally be a peak booking period, uh, re making sure customers know that if they do book and things don't go to plan, that we'll take care of it. Um, and it's so to, to, to me, that's that's sort of captured in that statement reassurance that we're just having to constantly reassure our customers that they can book with confidence and whatever happens, it'll be okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great word to sum it all up. Are you seeing any differences um, in the demographics uh, of those who are booking and, and reaching out? Do they tend to be younger than your, your typical customers, uh, older, has anything changed there? No, no, we've, we've, um, we have a lot of customer data and, and I think not really, no, um, our, our core customer, as we call them, or the Heartland customer is exactly the same. Um, you know, the ski market, the package ski market is dominated by a slightly older demographic anyway, um, certainly for us. And, uh, no, there's no change in customer. Um, the only thing that's really of note is that uh, we're probably seeing less families booking at present, um, you know, versus say the normal ski of the couples and the small groups or, or whatever. It's probably there's probably a little bit more reluctance, but that doesn't mean they've gone. They're just not booking as they're not as confident at the present time as perhaps the others are, which which I think is understandable. Mm -hmm. And you're too seeing mostly repeat customers that are in, uh, interested in booking. Yeah, um, uh, we the, the ski market is quite resilient um, for us in the UK and Ireland. I mean, what I mean by that is we when we go back to the recession of what was it 08, 09, 07, 08, uh, a lot of the holiday business um, was on its knees. It was it was a difficult few years. Um, the ski business also struggled a little bit, uh, but nowhere near to the same degree as perhaps the kind of other holiday types like the beach holidays and what have you which kind of highlighted not necessarily that the, the, the skier was kind of, you know, recession proof, but it kind of highlighted that the skiers are dedicated to the cause and, you know, come hell or high water, they're going to try and have their ski holiday. Um, and we know that anyway about our customers. So, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit like that at the moment, you know, we're thinking to ourselves, well, when we, when we stimulate the market with very aggressive offers, then we do see an immediate reaction and bookings do increase. It is a competitive environment, so sometimes you have to do that. 
when you don't have the offers in the market currently, you're seeing um, a drop off in demand, but you can't keep pumping offers into the market because ultimately we're a business and, and you know, <laughs> you know yeah. we use offers to stimulate business and what have you. But, but so, so it's an interesting one. Um, you know, there's a, we think there's going to be pent up demand and we believe that if, if uh, quarantines are removed, um, we believe uh, people uh, will, will book. Um, but again, as some of my friends on the panel have said, uh, the chances are this business is going to come very, very late. And when you're operating your holidays with um, charter aircraft, you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, where do you draw the line? Because you, yeah. you hold your nerve or, or do you call it a day? Yeah. And so how are you working with your partners to ensure mutual success in, in this, uh, you know, new situation and with what you were just mentioning you know what at what point do you say it's too, it's too close out or are you you know you can't you can't manage or you can't handle i think um certainly across europe um and i guess to a degree north america we've we've we recognized from the minute that the lockdown kicked in and we were repatriating that nine ninety nine percent of our partners and suppliers um were very accommodating, um, fully understand, understood the situation and, and were very, uh, very good at helping us do right by the customers. Now, as we look ahead to the next winter, again, you can see the same thing happening. You know, this isn't our, this isn't our challenge alone. It's, it's, a, it's a global challenge and an industry challenge. So suppliers are showing a lot of flexibility um, ahead, of, um, ahead of next winter. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think a lot of suppliers are thinking medium long term recognizing that this winter maybe we didn't expect it to be as tough as it probably will be but acknowledging the fact that it probably will be but it will hopefully just be a one-off and it'll just be this winter so you know when you when you take skiers into the european alps you are bumping into a lot of other source markets though so you know, if one country has a set of quarantine rules and the other doesn't, you know, they're, you know, what might be a bad season for one source market might be a great season for another because they don't have the same quarantine restrictions. So it's going to be interesting in Europe this, 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 this winter to see um, whether different countries rules and regulations about entering another country, how that impacts the general performance of the ski, um, of the ski resorts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I think in the U.S. we're seeing a lot of that too, with the different rules and regulations, state by state, and determining where people are going and what they're um, what they're interested in. So, well, thank you so much, Gordon. Um, that that was a really great conversation. So uh, we're going to move into our Q and A now. So Dan, Karen, and Eric, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, back on stage. And uh, we've already got a, a handful of questions. So thank you to our audience for submitting those. And uh, please do submit more if you have more. Uh, I'd like to start off with a question from uh, Sherwin. And I'd like to actually hear from everyone on this. Um, are you seeing a, a difference in interest between big resorts and uh, versus smaller resorts in relationship to COVID? Perhaps people are interested in being um, at a smaller mountain where there may not be as many people or or maybe that's not the case. Um, so Karen, would you like to take that one first? Sure. So I would say that the size of the mountain actually is not important. And what is important is the complexity of communication. So if the resort has a um, a, a payment policy that is hard to explain to our clients, that's where we're having, we're running into challenges. Um, but the easier that we can, we can talk about the product, the experience, the less complexity there is, the more success that we're having. So this, I'd say more than ever, is a time to remove any communication barriers, any barriers to communicating about the experience. And so I personally, I'm at Ski Cam, we're not seeing a big difference between the size of the mountain. Um, it's really more about what the, um, what our clients understand about how they can get there and what their experience will be like. 
Very interesting. Dan, I'll move over to you next. Yeah, <clears throat> we're not seeing really any difference between the big, the big ones and the small ones. I think that it's pretty standard. I think, <clears throat> I think that there will be probably an increase of demand later on for the Northeast for us, uh, for our Northeast um, clients who want to stay closer to home. But I was actually just doing, um, had an interview with Bloomberg last week, and they were trying to do a story on the mom and pop resorts. Um, really taking advantage of the situation and doing really well. And first I said, there aren't very many mom and pop resorts left. Right. But the other way that I was kind of thinking about it is that for the big resorts, for the ones that may be perceived as being crowded or are crowded, this is a great time to, to go there because they're being um, monitored differently. So, you know, if Breckenridge on a Saturday this year may not look like Breckenridge on a Saturday in years past. So this is a great opportunity to, to ski a big resort in a different situation. Yeah. I know people have used that um, for uh, like Disney that, you know, don't have to deal with the same crowd. So it's actually a great time to go. So Gordon, anything um, on your end there? Not really. Um, we we're looking, we, we, we've got a We've got a fair few results in our portfolio, some big, some small. I think, again, you know, while general volumes are down, people's choice of resorts um, hasn't changed. It's the same. You know, if you look at the ratios, then then you'd say, look, it's pretty much like it always was. You know, the, the high altitude premium resorts of the French Alps or, or for example, Whistler or Banff Lake Louise. These are the these are the premium resorts that people always book, you know, uh, you know, uh, that's where the volumes are and then, and then all the rest follows. But just to pick up on something mentioned right at the beginning, actually, I think what will, what will matter going nearer, coming nearer to the start of the season is like Vale resorts, we need the European regions, whether that's local, regional, national to start coming up, coming forward with some really clear directives on how they plan to manage the infrastructure in those resorts. A little bit like Vale has done. I mean, Vale didn't, layer too much detail in but it was reassuring to see so that's now something that we'll look towards the european businesses uh, you know ski companies to do because nearer the time if there is pent-up demand then that maybe will be something people are looking for a little bit of reassurance from the resorts not just from the tour operators mm -hmm. and eric anything to add to that i would say probably the only little thing and dan touched on it is um maybe a little uptick in the drive market in the Northeast where somebody would have gone and flown out West. But other than that, it's pretty much the same as what the others have said. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from Susan and this is related to holiday travel. So normally, you know, that's a huge um, time for ski and we've talked a lot about flexible uh, policies and um, do those same policies, are you seeing those same policies apply to um, holiday travel or, or is that not as flexible? I can take that one. Jump in first. <laughs> From our perspective, so I think generally speaking, it's more flexible than it normally is, but less flexible than non-festive, mm -hmm. to put it really simply. Does everybody else agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, some head, head shaking and nodding. Okay. Um, so well, and sorry, just another, just another thing. I think that there's, for a lot, there's call it a 40, 40 or 45 day policy for festive, which is again, different than it normally is, which is probably around 90 days. Um, and another way to get some sales, we don't know what's happening. Some resorts may be limiting occupancy. Um, in the hotels. So especially for festive, there's a little bit more urgency to, to lock it in and even to, you know, kind of quote RSVP for it, you could still get out of it, but hold your space for those busy times. Mm -hmm. Kat, we, we do have a, a few resorts that we're working with that have really flexible um, policies around the holidays. And we've seen a really strong res uh, response from our clients with that. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's great and, and it's also theoretical at this point. So as in a, a theoretical sale, right? That you right. Know, there's, there's no money down from the client. So I think it's fantastic. And I think that um, it's also not a bad thing to require 
to have a bit more stringent uh, policy for the holidays. Anyone else have anything to add there on that question before we move on? With the uh, with the chances of the lodging and the resorts themselves limiting the amount of people, I mean the the biggest thing to pass along is, you know, the earlier you book, the better off you're going to be. And there are a lot of good policies, like Dan has said, for these properties. And, you know, if you if you book your lift tickets early and get in line early, it's it's only going to help you. It can't hurt you. And so I'm going to move on to our next question, and this is, um, related to groups. So are any of you seeing um, group bookings and, and relatively large bookings or are these mostly, you know, single families and, and what do, do uh, does your group business look like? I can jump in. Uh, so this is something that we've been surprised about. Um, so our traditional group bookings are almost the same right now and again it, it's early days i i refer to these as theoretical sales at this point in time uh unlike previous years where we could certainly rely uh, a great deal more on the numbers at this point um but so that's been somewhat surprising but we also have another product we call ski escapes and they're hosted ski can group trips this year when we first of all we greatly reduced the number of offerings we have this year um, and when we launched we removed any any emphasis on social happenings during these trips so the dinners that we usually do the group activities we just removed that so there are hosted group trips um, and that there's a host there but other than that it's really kind of individuals traveling together and they've been selling uh, super successful, just moving really well. And uh, so that surprised us because we just weren't sure if people would prefer to travel with their own groups uh, or their, their friends that they know. Um, so um, one of our team members suggested maybe there's a strength in numbers, you know, the idea of it's okay or maybe a good idea to travel with a group. Anyway, so that's been our experience so far. Very interesting. Is anyone else seeing anything similar or, or different? Well, that's interesting, Karen. We we want to be doing more of those, but thought maybe this was not the year to, to push it. So <laughs> we're, we're seeing a lot of demand from groups and kind of to talk about, to build on what Gordon was saying, that skiers are a passionate group. And I think it's part of their identity. And we saw the same thing during the recession that the, the, the catch to being a skier is that you have to go skiing. So uh, the group people, as, as we all know, are very passionate. We're seeing a lot of demand from groups, but um, we've seen some cancellations. We're, we're proud to say that we had the Brotherhood business this year coming to Snowmass, but they canceled their trip. Um, and we've had some issues getting contracts with uh, the, the lodging suppliers for a variety of reasons. So um, Group is not an easy, it's not an easy part of the business this year, I would say. I, I think that it's more challenging, uh, definitely, than FIT this year. Gordon, you're shaking your head, so you agree? Yeah, I mean, groups by definition are a bit different on our market anyway. I think it's not ski groups or ski clubs or otherwise. It's groups for us are literally, you know, bookings of 10 customers or more. <laughs> um, and we don't, we, we like group business. We, we wish we could get more of it. Um, uh, this year, we've not seen... Again, like everything else I've said, uh, it's all relative, but the, 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 the groups are there um, and they're booking. Um, again, aligned with everything else, there's just overall less, uh, less activity currently, but you wouldn't say groups are massively up or down. It's probably, uh, they're probably where they normally are this, this point in time. All right, and uh, we've got time for about one more question. So, um, I'd like to know, so we talked a little bit about marketing messaging, but we didn't really talk about marketing focus and marketing dollars. Are you significantly um, moving your marketing dollars to drive markets and more uh, you know, local 
uh, customers than you were in, in the past and how has that shifted? Or, or maybe there's not a whole lot of marketing dollars out there. I know that that's very much a reality. Well, I can yeah, go I first think on that one, if you like. I mean, uh, from a, from an internal point of view, um, as I say, we we the, the the marketing was slowed down through the early part of the booking cycle. Um, it's ramping up again now. It's largely around um, largely around reassurance, um, and it will remain that way because we believe that's what's needed currently. I wouldn't say we're spending less. We're probably spending the same. Um, but maybe we'll we'll have to wait to invest some of that money in marketing until. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, child in the background. Uh, until later in the uh, until late later in the booking cycle, if we see some traction, um, we have had a good response though from partners. So from resorts and regions and national tourist offices, certainly in Europe at the moment, a little bit North America, people want to start messaging customers at a given point in time because they believe there will be business. It's just deciding not so much what to spend, but but what kind of activity and when. Um, so we've got that. We've been quite surprised by that, and we're actually quite. It's quite positive actually um, that there are regions and areas of, of the ski um, of the of the ski resorts and what have you that want to uh, want to promote, which is good. And Karen, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I was going to say marketing dollars. <laughs> uh, I. I would say that we're we have a bit of a guerrilla marketing approach this year and that we're um, doing things ourselves um, so I guess more specifically we are trying to do a hike in a few weeks where we're inviting some of our clients out on a hike social distance hike um, we're doing this with a local ski shop and um and so we're trying to do something that's relatively safe hands-on and it's an indirect sales opportunity so we can we can talk to our clients um it's kind of a soft sell opportunity um we are we've been running something called dockside chats which is fairly similar to what we're doing right now so it's a, a zoom panel type discussion we invite um, leaders from the ski industry and, and the airline um, to talk to our clients, uh, to answer questions and, and just talk about what's been going on at the ski resorts. Because we know in this industry, we've been involved in this since mid-March. Our clients do not, often they don't know what's been going on. And the resorts have been open. There's been mountain biking, there's been golfing, all kinds of great things. The airlines have been constantly troubleshooting everything about travel and so we've been trying to get that information to our clients so it's a lot more of an informative approach but in terms of our traditional marketing dollars that's a very different uh, thing this year yeah absolutely well that sounds like a very creative way to connect with uh, uh, your your audience and uh, hopefully not too expensive <laughs> um, anything Eric or Dan to add to that before we wrap up well, for, for us, um, time will tell. I think the biggest shift for us is that we've brought it all kind of in-house, which we do all, almost all of our marketing in-house anyway. But when I say in-house is that normally we're, we're let's say pre-purchasing media, uh, where we're under contract to, to spend a certain amount or have a certain number of impressions. And this year it's all in-house, we're controlling it all. And as long as we continue to see a positive ROI, we'll continue to spend. But I will say that we, you know, kind of what Karen is saying, the consumer is in the dark. They don't know that there's even going to be a ski season. We, we know a lot more than they do. So uh, I think that we started our marketing earlier. We hope to do the same amount or more, but it all just depends on the ROI, which we're looking at very closely. And we're holding it right now. We're not, we're not holding it, but we haven't hit the gas yet. So when the, when the demand kicks in, then our marketing will kick in more. So we're just uh, keeping a really close eye on everything. Yeah. Well, we are at time and I don't, don't want to keep any of our audience uh, over. So with that, I will say thank you so much to Gordon, Dan, Karen, and Eric. We really appreciate you being here and taking the time to have this conversation with us today. And just a reminder to the audience listening to please give us your feedback in the uh, survey that will open when the webinar ends. So thanks Great. so much, everybody. Thanks, Kat. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. Okay.